Hey, seventh grade, it's Mr. Alltop here, and today we are going to read chapter 21 of Liddy. The uh, title of this chapter is Turpitude, which is a word you probably have not come across before, um, but we will see this in this chapter. So before we read chapter 21, just want to remind you what happened in chapter 20. At the very end, Liddy came back into work and saw Mr. Marsden um, inappropriately touching Bridget. And Liddy came to Bridget's defense by dumping a pail of water over Mr. Marston's head and then running out the door with Bridget. And as they ran out, they were laughing and laughing and laughing and laughing. Okay, so now we start chapter 21, Turpitude. By morning, the laughter was long past. She was awake and dressed, pacing the narrow corridor be between the beds before the 4.30 bell. Her breath caught high in her throat and her blood raced around her body, undecided whether to run fire through her veins, searing her despite the November chill, or freeze to the icy rivulet of a mountain brook. She could not touch her breakfast. The smell of fried codfish turned her stomach. But she sat there amidst the chatter and clatter of the meal because it was easier to pass the time in the noise of company and in the raging silence of her room. She was the first at the gate. It wasn't that she was eager for the day to begin, but eager for it to be over, for whatever was to happen, and she did not doubt that something dreadful must happen, for whatever must happen to be in the past. She tried not to think her Bridget. She could not take on Bridget's fate as well as her own. If only she had not come back up the stairs. Monster! Would I have wished to leave that poor child alone? Better to feed Rachel and Agnes to the bear. And yet, Bridget was not a helpless child. She might have broken loose, stomped his foot, or... Well, it was too late for that. Liddy had gone back. She had mercy on her, picked up that pail of filthy water, and crammed it down on the overseer's neat little head. And all she had need to do was speak. When she had called his name, he had turned and let Bridget go. But no, Liddy could not be satisfied. She had taken that pail and rammed it till the man's shoulders were almost squeezed up under the tin. The skin on her scalp crawled. Why didn't they open the gate? She was as weary of the scene in her head as if she'd actually picked up that heavy bucket and brought it down over and over again and run the length of the yard, dragging Bridget behind her a thousand times over, laughing. Of course, he must have heard her. She had howled like a maniac. He must have heard. The other operatives were crowded about, jostling her as they all waited for the bell. And still, when it rang, she jumped. It was so loud, so like an alarm clanging danger. She tried to turn against the tide to get away while there was still time, but she was caught in the chattering, laughing trap of factory girls pushing themselves forward into the new day. She gave up and allowed the press of bodies around her to propel her up to the, to the enclosed staircase and up the four flights to the weaving room. Bridget was not at her looms. Mr. Marston was not on his high stool. Her execution was delayed. She felt relief, which was immediately swallowed up in anxiety. She needed it all to be over. One of the girls from the acre approached her. Bridget says to tell you she's feeling a wee bit poorly this morning. You are not to worry. The little coward. She's going to let me face it all alone, eh? When I was the one risk all to help her? The girl glanced back over her shoulder and around the room. She bent her face close to Liddy's neck and whispered, The truth be told, she got word not to report this morning, but she had no wish to alarm you. Now Liddy was truly alarmed, without even the slight armor that resentment might provide. Would they, then, be punishing Bridget instead of her? What sin had Bridget committed? What rule had she ever trespassed? and she with a sickly mother and nearly a bro dozen brothers and sisters to care for. Mr. Marston had come in. Liddy kept her eyes carefully on her looms. The room shook and shuddered into life. Liddy and the Irish girl beyond kept Bridget's looms going between them as best they could. She was almost busy enough to suppress her fears. And then 
a young man, the agent's clerk in his neat suit and cravat, appeared at her side and asked her to come with him to the agent's office. The time had come at last. She shut down her own looms and one of Bridget's and followed the clerk down the stairs and out across the yard to the low building that housed the counting room and the offices. The agent Graves was seated at his huge roll-top desk and did not at once turn from his papers and acknowledge her presence. The clerk had only taken her as far as the door, so she stood just inside as he closed it behind her. She tried to breathe. She waited like that, hardly able to get a breath past her Adam's apple, until she began to feel quite faint. Would she collapse then in a heap on the rug? She studied the pattern, shades of dull browns, starting nearly black in the center and spinning out lighter and lighter to a dirty yellow at the outer edge. Dizzy, she stumbled a step forward to keep from falling. The man turned in his chair as though annoyed. He was wearing half spectacles, and he lowered his massive head and stared over them at her. You sent for me, sir. It came out like a hen cackle. Yes, you sent for me, sir. She was glad to hear her voice grow stronger. The man kept staring at, at as though she were a maggot on his dish. Lydia Worthen, sir, you sent for me. Ah, yes, Miss Worthen. He neither stood nor asked her, uh, nor asked her to sit down. Miss Worthen. He gathered the papers he had been working on and tamped the bottom of the pile on his desk and eaten it, and then laid the stack down on the right side of the desk. Then he scraped his chair around to face her more directly. Miss Worthen, I've had a distressing interview with your overseer this morning. She couldn't help but wonder how Mr. Marsden had retold last night's encounter. It seems, he continued, it seems you are a troublemaker in the weaving room. He was studying her closely now, as closely as he had studied his papers before. A troublemaker, he repeated. I, sir? Yes, Mr. Marston fears you are having a bad influence on the other girls there. So there had been no report of last night. That at least seemed clear. I do my work, sir, Liddy said, gathering courage. I have no intention of causing trouble on the floor. How long have you been with us, Miss Worthen? A year, sir. Last April, sir. At how many looms are you tending at this time? Four, sir. I see. And your wages, on the average? I make a good wage, sir. Lately it's been three dollars above my board. Are you satisfied with these wages, then? Yes, sir. I see. And the hours? I'm used to long hours. I manage. I see. And none of this... He waved a massive hand. None of this ten-hour business, eh? I never signed a petition. I meant to, but no need for you to know it. There was a long pause during which the agent took off his spectacles as though to see her better. So, he said finally, you are not one of these female reform girls? No, sir. I see he said, replacing his spectacles and looking quite as though he saw much less than he had a few minutes before. I see. She took a tiny step forward. May I ask, sir, why I'm being called a troublemaker? She spoke very softly, but the agent heard her. Yes, well, maybe, her heart thumped in admiration for her own boldness, maybe Mr. Marston should be called, sir. How is it exactly that I have displeased him? Her voice went up to soften the request into a question. Yes, well, he hesitated. Open the door. And when Liddy obeyed, he called to the clerk to summon Mr. Marsden, then turned again to Liddy. You may sit down, Mr. W Miss Worthen, he said, and went back to the papers on his desk. Though the chair he indicated was narrow and straight, she was grateful to sit down at last. The spurt of courage had exhausted her as much as her fear had earlier. She was glad, too, to have time to pull her rioting thoughts together. The longer she waited, the greater the tumult inside her. 
so that when the clerk opened the door and Mr. Marsden appeared, she could only just keep from jumping up and crying out. She pressed her back into the spindles of the chair until she could almost feel the print of the wood through her chest. She kept her eyes on the dizzying oval spiral of the rug. There was a clearing of the throat, and then, You sent for me, sir. Liddy nearly laughed aloud. Her exact words, not ten minutes before. The superintendent turned in his chair, but again, he did not stand or offer the visitor a chair. Miss Worthen here asks to know the charges against her. Mr. Marsden <clears throat> coughed. Liddy looked up despite herself. At her glance, the overseer blinked quickly, then composed himself, his lids hooding his little dark eyes, his rosebud mouth tightening to a slit. This one is a troublemaker, he said evenly. She leapt to her feet. She couldn't seem to stop herself. A troublemaker! Then what be you, Mr. Marston? What be you, eh? The agent's head went up. His body was spread, and his eyes bulged like a great toad poised to spring. Sit down, Miss Worthen. She sank onto the chair. Her outburst had given the overseer the time he needed. He smiled slightly as though to say, See, no lady, this one. Satisfied that he had stilled her, the agent shifted his gaze from Liddy to her accuser. A troublemaker, Mr. Marston. For a quick moment, Liddy hoped, but the man went on. In what way, a troublemaker? Her work seems satisfactory. It is not. And now Mr. Marston turned and glared straight at Liddy, all trace of nervousness gone. It is not her work as such. Indeed. And here he gave a sad little laugh. <laughs> I at one time thought of her as one of the best on the floor. But, he turned back to the agent, his voice solemn and quiet. I am forced, sir, to ask for her dismissal. It is a matter of moral turpitude. Moral what? What was he saying? What was he accusing her of? I see, said the agent as though all had been explained when nothing, nothing had. I cannot, and now the overseer's voice was fairly dripping with the honey of regret. For the sake of all the innocent young women in my care, I cannot have among my girls someone who sets an example of moral turpitude. Certainly not, Mr. Marston. The corporation cannot countenance moral turpitude. She turned, unbelieving, from one man to the other, but they ignored her. She fought for words to counter the drift the interview had taken, but what could she say? She did not know what turpitude was. How could she deny something she did not know even, it did not even know existed? She knew what moral was, but that didn't help. Moral was Amelia's territory of faithful attendance and Sabbath worship and prayer meeting and Bible study, and she couldn't ask for consideration on those counts. She hardly ever went to worship, and Lord knew when she read it wasn't just the Bible. Still, she was no worse than many, was she? At least she was not a papist, and no one was condemning them. She opened her mouth. They were both looking at her sadly, but sternly, in the silence. The battle had been lost. You may ask the clerk for whatever wages are due you, Miss Worthen, the agent said, turning to his desk. Mr. Marston gave his superiors back a nod and a tight rosebud smile. Did he click his heels? At any rate, he left quickly without another glance toward Liddy. You may go now, the agent said without turning. What could she do? She stumbled to her feet and out the door. They paid her wages full and just, but there was no certificate of honorable discharge from the Concord Corporation. And with no certificate, she would never be hired by any other corporation in Lowell. She walked out of the tall gate benumbed. She had often dreamed of this last day, but in her dream, she would be going home in triumph and now there was no triumph and no home to go to, even in disgrace.